welcome everyone who's joined us so far and those who are continuing to join us to our very special webinar events from the Hart House Literary and Library Committee this month titled The World Building of Wakanda, uh, Exploring Black Panther and Afrofuturism. So this event is part of an ongoing series here at Hart House this month called Black Futures. Uh, and we'll discuss that in just a minute. Uh, but first, I want to introduce myself. So hello, everyone. My name is Vikram Najawan. I am part of the Hart House Literary and Library Committee at the University of Toronto. And specifically, I helm the Writers Co-op Division. Now, at Writers Co-op, we usually handle the practical wing when it comes to creative writing, which includes subjects such as world building which is why I was eager to jump on the opportunity to discuss world building in a very special and important context as it relates to the genre of Afrofuturism and specifically the world of Wakanda in the Black Panther films and comic series. Now here uh, at Lit and Lib and at Hard House, we feel it's incredibly important to promote uh, this genre, which is perhaps lesser known among the general population. Uh, and I hope that through this discussion, uh, everyone will be able to learn uh, a thing or two. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which Hart House and UFT lies. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional home of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and in the case of Lit and Lib, to write on this land. Now, I feel the discussion of land is incredibly and especially important to our current discussion, which is all about geography, terrain, and general world building. So of course, we have to keep that in mind. And I also acknowledge that being uh, the child of immigrants and a second generation uh, immigrant and Canadian myself, that I have prospered uh, on the land that Indigenous people uh, have lived on for thousands of years. And I think it's especially important that as we become more cognizant of these things, we try to highlight uh, lesser known forms of storytelling uh, and narrative. Uh, one way I've tried to increase my fluency in that regard is through learning more about orality and oral storytelling, which has often been overlooked in favor of written storytelling. And I know a few of my panelists have also sought to do that in their respective endeavors, which they can talk about in a bit. But first, before we get into that, uh, I feel we need to uh, provide a general overview of what Black Futures is all about. Uh, so as you can see on the slide, it's a series of programs using the lens of the genre of Afrofuturism to explore and present arts, dialogue, and well-being here at Hart House. So a couple of questions to keep in mind here. What will the future bring for Black women, men, and children? Who is responsible for Black futures, shifting narratives, flipping experiences, and crafting new realities? Hart House explores the idea of Afrofuturism as a way to blend the knowledge of the past with a reimagining of the future. A showcase of intersectional arts and dialogue, the series aims to reflect the experiences of today's Black leaders and artists while providing a platform for real world knowledge to help students be future ready, self-aware, and empowered citizens as they move into their imagined realities. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce our three excellent author panelists for today, or rather allow them to introduce themselves, uh, beginning with Antoine Bandelet. This is for the part where I can unmute myself and reveal myself, correct? <laughs> yeah. Hey, my name is Antoine. So yeah, I am a YouTuber and author of uh, mostly uh, Black uh, speculative literature. Uh, some of it is kind of the old timey, like pre-colonial African fantasy stuff. And then I also have contemporary as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Antoine. And next we have Stephanie Christman. Hey, everybody. Um, so uh, my name is Stephanie Christman. I'm an Afrofuturist author, political scientist, um, nationally recognized journalist and essayist. Um, I utilize Afrofuturism primarily to explore social justice and dismantling 
um, oppression. Um, but I'm also a huge geek who loves Legos, movies, and gaming. So, um, and I checked out your uh, checked out your YouTube, and it's amazing. Let's just say that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nice to have you with us, Stephanie. And last, but certainly not least, a good family friend of mine, Rashid Moadin. Ah, hey there. Uh, I'm uh, Rashid Mohideen. Um I'm sort of a bartender, but mostly the founder and editor of two uh, indie magazines here in Toronto. Um, and I love history, and uh, a lot of my focus is on decolonizing history and trying to kind of like recapture how we've been told our stories to chart a course forward that may be a little less uh, restricted. Awesome. Thanks so much to all three of our panelists. So with that out of the way, I feel before we launch into the discussion, uh, it is helpful to get a bit of a, a grounding, especially for those who may be unfamiliar with some of the terms we'll be discussing. So we have a few slides uh, to that effect uh, where we can establish a few terms uh, and uh, yeah, perhaps lay a nice foundation for us uh, to launch into our discussion. So I think we're just getting the slideshow ready for that. And this is also a nice time for me to let you know that the auto captions are on. So if you can see that creepy thing at the bottom right there that's transcribing everything I'm saying, uh, that, that is uh, for your benefits. Um, I'm trying not to look at it too much because it's freaking me out, but you, you've, got to love, you've got to love how Zoom is that advanced. Um, but uh, any, anyhow, uh, this, so one of the, the words uh, in this event title was the world building of Wakanda. So I feel it's necessary that we briefly go over what world building means. It's something you've all probably heard in the context of sci-fi and fantasy. And it's become sort of lingua franca more recently. Uh, but for those of you who may not know, in, in the simplest possible way I could describe it, I think world building describes making a fictional world as realistic as possible. Now, when we talk about realistic, we don't necessarily mean realism. It doesn't mean that the world has to adhere to all the laws or scientific principles or everything that we keep in mind in our world. No, it just means it has to have a certain machinery and consistency in its own right. However, the degrees of that can differ depending on the author's intent uh, and what kind of sci-fi and or fantasy world they want to construct. But I, I summed it all up in this nice pithy little axiom here. Uh, you don't need the laws of physics to explain psychics. So I, I think that uh, pretty much sums up the idea of internal consistency uh, when it comes to world building. And on top of that, uh, there are a few sort of corollary terms to keep in mind when we talk about different types of world building. So this idea of a hard and soft world building and sort of put as uh, dichotomous opposites, but it's really more of a spectrum just like with many things. So when we talk about a harder world building, it's usually involving a unique set of properties, rules and specific principles by which a fictional world operates. So more of that uh, mechanical, automated, orderly type of fictional world uh, that you would uh, imagine in uh, certain fantasy franchises compared to softer world building, which is a little more whimsical, uh, more about escapism and creating a spectacular world over creating a, a super uh, plausible and consistent world. And it's worth noting that neither one of these is objectively better than the other. These are simply just two different ways that authors can approach world building, whether it be in sci-fi or fantasy. And part and parcel in that is this idea of secondary world fiction, uh, which is sci-fi fantasy set in a world that's distinctly different from ours rather than some vision of it. So these are just some basic terms I feel it's helpful to keep in mind when we get into our discussion about Wakanda. So now that we've got world building out of the way, I feel it's also incumbent to talk about Afrofuturism, the other buzzword in the title. And I will say right now, uh, Stephanie designed these excellent slides for me. So I just want to give a shout out to her uh, and there are a lot of quotes here uh, from renowned scholars and authors uh, in the genre. And I feel like they'll give us a good picture 
uh, of what we can expect. So this first one here, Afrofuturism is an exploration and methodology of liberation, simultaneously both the location and a journey. Uh, I think that's a really interesting way to, to envision it. Uh, and it'll stack up well uh, with some other definitions we have here. Uh, take a look at this one. The descendants of alien abductees inhabiting a sci-fi nightmare in which an unseen but no less impossible force fields of intolerance frustrates their movements whilst official histories undo what has been done. What I particularly like about this definition is just the very terminology here, alien abductees, sci-fi nightmare, impossible force fields. All this terminology that we see as synonymous with the very sci-fi genre uh, being repurposed to describe a, a very specific uh, demographic and cultural experience, which I think, in my opinion, is really sort of the heart of the genre of Afrofuturism and which our panelists can talk about more in depth. Uh, some more uh, scholar, scholarly authority here. We have Adrienne Marie Brown, who is considered a, a flagship uh, writer and critic in the genre. She says, if we want worlds that work more for us more, we have, uh, more, we have to have more of us involved in the visioning process. So this idea of imagination to create a better world, which again is a central precept, uh, we can say of Afrofuturism. And one of the ways and perhaps it's uh, a more educated or educative uh, genre and one that's important to keep in mind if we're talking about social progress. What's interesting about this term Afrofuturism is that it was not coined by a black author initially, but by a white author, Mark Derry, uh, in his essay called Black to the Future in this collection called Flame Wars, The Discourse of Cyberpunk. Uh, and he originally used the term to describe the works of authors like Samuel Delaney and Octavia Butler. So again, this wide umbrella under which we can uh, group sword and sorcery works, which is more where Samuel Delaney liked uh, to play with, uh, versus Octavia Butler, uh, who delved into both sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, but the commonality between all these, at least from Delaney's initial, uh, initial understanding and perspective, uh, was that uh, these authors uh, wrote uh, from a, a particular position, of course, that being Black, but it also played with uh, different uh, identities, whether that be uh, queer sensibilities uh, in Delaney's case or particular socioeconomic circumstances. But above all, from his perception here, uh, Derry sort of saw Afrofuturism and sci-fi as a vehicle for Black authors to truly narrate the Black experience of their ancestors and descendants. However, as uh, we will get into later, the term has definitely taken on different connotations under uh, Black authors and perhaps repurposed to a certain extent, but it'll be interesting to get our panelists' take on that. Uh, just a few closing thoughts here, uh, some nice axioms. Afrofuturism can provide a new language to address the increasingly complicated frameworks of discrimination. It's one of the best benefits of it. Uh, but additionally, there is a need for more analysis of the relationships between race, sexuality, gender, technology, and the utopian impulses of those marked as deviant. Uh, and finally, the erasure of the other from futuristic societies and imaginings in sci-fi is an example of the invisibility that we face in contemporary society. So these are three things that are important to keep in mind when we're discussing the genre. And I had a, a slide here. I don't know where it's gone, but uh, if you're looking for non-literary applications for Afrofuturism, perhaps more musical examples, uh, there are things like uh, the group Earth, Wind and Fire, and even artists like Janelle Monet, who implement uh, imagery from Egyptian mythology uh, in their music videos, album cover, uh, and things like that. So it's, it's a very, a uh, wide ranging uh, genre uh, field through which we can view uh, many things, whether it be written works and genre uh, or musical styles uh, and a nice eclectic mix of things. Of course, when you ask the average person for an example of Afrofuturism, 
they will probably say Black Panther and Wakanda, hence the focus of our discussion here. So we feel just before we launch into the discussion that we play this brief video for you all, just to refresh our knowledge on Wakanda, uh, set the terrain. Uh, so we're going to play that right now. So enjoy folks. Two point five million years ago, a meteorite crashed deep within the lush green forests and plains of East Africa. This meteorite brought with it a strange new element with astonishing properties, vibranium and it altered the very flora and fauna around it. Throughout the centuries, the landscape was transformed by its presence, until it had become a place without equal across the entirety of the Earth. Five tribes settled the region, discovering and claiming this wealth as their own. To the outside world, this nation is only another third world country, unstable and stricken by poverty. But beneath the protection of a technologically advanced cloaking field, there lies the secret jewel of Africa, the Kingdom of Wakanda. Bordered by Uganda, South Sudan, and Kenya, this small country has neither garnered nor sought any significant attention on the international stage. Though the kingdom has embassies around the globe, the country has very little economic or strategic value to the rest of the world. This, however, is a carefully constructed ruse, for Wakanda is, in actuality, the most technologically advanced nation on the planet. The presence of vibranium, a rarity elsewhere, has allowed the Wakandans to develop sophisticated agricultural, military, medical, and scientific achievements, ensuring that every citizen has an incredibly high quality of life. A hereditary monarchy, Wakanda's king is bestowed the title of Black Panther, so named for the first to unite the tribes of Wakanda. Each tribe has at its head an elder to serve on the king's council, bringing each tribe's perspective on matters of state and allowing open discussion and debate. Ultimately, however, the king is solely responsible for the governance of his country and must prove himself worthy of the responsibility. On the day of his coronation, the king presents himself at the Warrior Falls, an ancient site where questions of leadership are decided. Any tribe who deems the ruler unfit to lead has the right to name a challenger. This challenger must best the ruler in ritual combat, ensuring the leader of Wakanda will always have the strength to lead the nation. For centuries, the kings of Wakanda have come from the Panther tribe, also known as the Golden Tribe, as the ruling family, most of their members are trained in leadership and academic roles. The remaining tribes have likewise come to inherit distinct roles in Wakandan society. The border tribe is responsible for the protection of Wakanda, ensuring no outsider could enter without being first invited. They live primarily in the mountainous regions of the country's edge, and embody simple lives of farming and hunting as well as breeding the formidable white rhinoceros for use in battle. Some families within the border tribe live outside the cloaking field, and their deceptively simple lives lead credence to the idea that Wakanda is primitive and poverty-stricken, keeping foreign eyes away. The mining tribe is responsible for the extraction of the alien metal vibranium from the earth, and it remains Wakanda's most valuable resource. The merchant and river tribes then trade and refine these resources, making up the bulk of the Wakandan economy. The only tribe to not have a seat on the tribal council is the Jabari, also known as the Mountain Tribe. A fierce group dedicated to the ape god Hanuman, they rejected the rule of the Panther Tribe and retreated to the high mountain regions, further isolating themselves from the rest of the world. Military power in Wakanda is divided between the Border Tribe and the Hatu Zarazé, which translates to the Dogs of War. While the Border Tribe is in charge of national security, the War Dogs serve as a kind of secret police and intelligence agency, with many agents stationed all over the world, from Nigeria to the United States of America. Every War Dog is marked with a tattoo on the inside of their lip, 
ensuring that war dogs can easily identify each other when in the field. The reigning Black Panther has a contingent of bodyguards known as the Dora Milaje. This all-female special forces group escorts the king on all his missions outside the country, providing security and support. They specialize in the spear and hand-to-hand -hand combat, and can be readily identified by their shaved heads. In the time before Wakanda was united, the five tribes were at constant war with one another for resources and martial supremacy. It is said that the first Black Panther, Bashenga, was guided by the panther goddess Bast to a powerful heart-shaped herb, mutated by the vibranium around it. Once ingested, this flower allowed Bashenga to travel to the ancestral plane, where he was granted superhuman strength and abilities, through which he was able to unite all the tribes, with the exception of the Jabari. This flower is still used in the Warrior Falls ritual, with each new Black Panther given a tea brewed from its petals after his victory. These flowers are protected and cared for by shamans, who oversee all religious and spiritual ceremonies within Wakanda. Wakanda's longtime isolationist policies were uprooted, however, when an unexpected challenger arrived at Warrior Falls. Ndjaka, cousin to the current Black Panther T'Challa, and better known by his American name Eric Killmonger Stevens, defeated T'Challa in single combat, becoming the newest king of Wakanda. Seeking revenge for the centuries of oppression Africans have faced throughout history, Ndjaka began sending vibranium weapons and supplies across the world in preparation for an assault on the Earth's most powerful nations. The resulting civil war and conflict between Ndjaka and the resurrected T'Challa ended with the loss of many Wakandan lives, though T'Challa did honor Ndjaka's wish to open the Wakandan borders and help their brothers and sisters across the world. With Wakanda beginning to share its knowledge and technology, there had grown a spark of hope that the once ignored nations of Africa might have found greater prominence on the international stage. Cosmic events have shattered these dreams. A battle fought and lost on the plains of Wakanda has rocked the very fabric of reality, with half of all life now gone, perhaps forever. The Templin Institute investigates alternate worlds and realities. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to directly support us, vote in polls to determine future topics, and receive some cool rewards, please consider pledging. So I should say that this video came out uh, before Avengers Endgame did, so spoiler alert for the three of you who probably haven't seen that movie yet. <laughs> things, things worked out in the end, uh, sort of. If only all our real world problems could be solved by the snap of a finger, but such <laughs> as it is. Um, so now I think that video gave a nice intricate overview of some of the world building aspects of Wakanda. So now we can launch into our discussion with a little more context. So first off, I just wanted to ask each of our panelists, uh, since Black Panther and Wakanda is a franchise that strips back to at least the mid 60s. So it's been around for, for quite a bit, even if the movies have only gained popularity within recent years. So I'm curious to hear from each one of you, uh, when did you sort of first discover Black Panther and the, the world of Wakanda? And sort of how did you feel upon immersing yourselves in this setting for the first time? And maybe Antoine, we could start with you. Uh, yeah, uh, so I was always familiar with it, but I'm not a big comic book person. So I didn't really um, interact with it much. The most I did was usually movies and that was like stuff like Meteor Man and Blank Man, which most people don't really remember uh, those 90s uh, black films. I mean, people remember Spawn because that was pretty big, but not like Meteor Man was my stuff like back in the day. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, the movie that I started looking into some of the, the comic books, some of the novels that were out of it too, because I, you know, I typically like to read novels. It's like my favorite kind of medium to, to interact with. Uh, but it was, well, yeah, it wasn't until the movie that I like, you know, realized like what it was in a, in a big way. Awesome. Yeah. And I know Antoine has a, a great video where he discusses his sort of personal experience with black superhero movies leading up to Black Panther. So definitely check that out, folks. Um, how about you, Stephanie? 
Yeah, um, I also wasn't super into comic books when I was growing up, but uh, I think the first time I had ever heard of Black Panther was in relationship to Storm. Um, and so because I guess there was a romance there, so I was really kind of into Storm um, during the X-Men cartoon days. Um, and so, um, so I kind of heard about uh, Black Panther from there, but then um, when the movie came out, that's when I was like, oh, wow, you know, let's think more about this. I was already kind of in the process of doing my own writing and that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, it, um, and then kind of watching the movie was just like, whoa, this is so amazing. Um, just feeling myself being connected to the characters just right away. And, uh, and the kind of wild possibility of uh, a nation that hadn't been co colonialized. You know what I'm saying? So I would like to yeah. see the piggyback off of that because that was a huge thing for me too, because yeah, yeah. most of the, and to talk about the video that you mentioned uh, that I did, that the difference between Black Panther and the other ones that I watched before that, because we had Blade, we had Meteor Man, we had Blank Man, we had a bunch of, you know, in Spawn, we had Black superheroes, Static Shock. But the difference mm -hmm. with this one is that it was set in Africa and it was unapologetically African. Exactly. And that was what the significance of Black Panther was to me in particular. Just wanted to piggyback on that because I thought that was a really good point you made. Oh, no, that's, 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 that's so true. <laughs> that's so true. Yep. Yeah, awesome. And please do feel free to just interject whenever you want. There's no like <laughs> strict order here. So I want to hear everyone's thoughts. If you're just dying to say something, uh, please let it be known. Um, but Stephanie, you brought up an interesting point with Storm because they're sort of like, I don't think they're still together, but they were like a power couple in the Marvel yeah. Universe for a while. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was really pretty cool. Um, but yeah, sorry, you had further thoughts to share, Stephanie. Oh, no, I was just wondering what Rashi was going to say. Oh, yeah, well, like uh, I think you mentioned, like mentioning Storm is interesting because um, like when I moved to Canada as a 10 year old, um, I kind of dove head first into Western culture to try to like mm -hmm. ingratiate myself to where I was. Mm -hmm. um, and like superhero movies appealed to me, like, like you know, Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man, all that kind of stuff and the original X-Men um, mm -hmm. uh, with Hugh Jackman and like Storm was kind of the only POC. Yeah. Um, and then even when they started rolling out like the Iron Mans and stuff, you know, like the, the black dude was always a sidekick. And that was kind of like always the shtick was like, you're the sidekick, you're here to help. And like, that was kind of refracted through our culture in general. Um, so you, there was like a slow move um, over the last like 15 years towards the space that allowed us to have something like Black Panther. And like, honestly, like I saw the movie twice in theaters. Um, the first time I saw it, um, there's like a flyover scene um, mm -hmm. right when they're going to Wakanda through like, uh, like some like nomadic pastoralists or whatever. And like, that's like an image that like I've seen, because like, I spent part of my childhood in Africa and East Africa and West Africa. And like, that's an image I would have seen in my childhood. Mm -hmm. And it genuinely made me cry. Like I fucking cried in the theaters, like tears <laughs> breathing down my face, just like, holy shit. Like, I didn't know how much that meant to me until yeah. I actually saw it. And like, it was set to like a rhythmic tribal soundtrack mm -hmm. too. And then like, mm -hmm. in a, like, if you watch the movie again, you'll notice that like, there's a beat the whole time. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a subtle beat but it's a subtle drum beat mm. because the movie is a rhythm you know and, and that's something that you don't normally get in like um it's gonna call it white movies you know mm -hmm. um so, well, to like, go back to your the introduction of Wakanda, like as a historian in particular mm -hmm. um I kind of made that kind of analogy to kind of um the the, the Mali empire in Mansa mm. Musa because it's very similar the idea of like you know you're trying to hold on to something that's going to be coveted by the world the city, the city of gold right right so yeah yeah he was like the lord of the mines the gold mines and the salt mines and so he went through you know north africa and into arabia to just giving away gold and like bringing down the value of gold in egypt <laughs> for a time right. and then then you know you see european maps with like this one guy who has like a gold piece and it's like it's that same idea of like wakanda you know like the protection of that and like hey there's more to africa than just like you know just this, this huge desert or like jungle and stuff like that you know so i thought that was a an interesting idea, especially when when you get to Wakanda, you actually do see some structures that are from like, you know, um, Mali or like Timbuktu, like they had a lot of those uh, adaptations I thought were really cool. Well, that was a really neat part of how they developed that world was they kind of like um, pulled little bits of cultures all over the continent to try and do this kind of like pan-Africanist vision, like, you know, Kwame Nkrumah is like so happy this happened. 
mm-hmm. um, where, where, and like, like the thing is like, while on the one hand, it's wonderful to be able to have this Pan-Africanism, on the other hand, it's like, that's kind of like step one. So then that, that gives us the space to now actually start to talk about the diversity of the, of the African continent, you know? Um, I'm very glad you mentioned that because yeah yeah, it's it's entirely in that but that's good though because you do kind of need that funnel right you need the funnel of like here's the broad strokes and now we're starting to get more specific things when we're having uh things like children of blood and bone which is very much about the Orishas and West (laughs) Africa and you have other you know uh, things coming I think uh, what was the one uh Disney announced a a Wanju I think I can't remember what it was called but that's also doing very you know specific kind of things there was one called Kariba which was a South African like the you get to get more of that now because Black Panther has sort of opened the floodgates for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, totally. Yeah. And it's, and, and, and it's like, um, it's the kind of thing that's really, really inspiring to creators as well because it's shown us, like it's given us more examples than we could have ever have dreamed of, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, and just thinking about like, um the ways in which um and i know we're going to talk about it a little bit later probably but um just thinking about so many different things that came up within the movie just thinking about the ways in which women were like a upfront and important piece of Mm -hmm. the story um that um this idea of attention of um which for me was very important around blackness this tension of do we allow people into this, uh, you know, amazingly wonderful black space, uh, white people in particular, do we let other people um, who are not a part of our group into um, this particular space? I mean, and that's very, even within our own kind of working in a modern real world is something that we have to think about a lot, um, especially in a world that, um, is very covetous, covetous of mm-hmm. our, you know, of our culture, um, the, the black diaspora, and in, in, in specifically. Well, it's 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 interesting because in the movie, there's that one scene with a uh, little uh, Hobbit man's who gets like he's hurt, he's brought mm-hmm. in, and then mm-hmm. Shooty's like, oh great, like another white boy for us to fix. Yeah. And I, I thought that was like it was a reference to something later on. Um, uh-huh. But like, I thought that was like not that wasn't just like a coded reference within the Marvel universe. That was like right. very much a coded reference at what it is that Black culture does to whiteness. Yeah. Which is yeah, we're here to fix your problems again. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Know? Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you all touch on, I think you yeah I mean I think that sort of touches upon another really interesting point uh that we've all sort of addressed like the very compositional nature of Wakanda so on the one hand you have all this futurism and advanced technology uh and all this wealth but you also have a deep reverence for tradition a certain uh cultural authenticity pan-Africanism whatever term you'd like to use to describe it and just the, the hybridity of those two things. Uh, so I'm curious to sort of hear from all of you, um, how do you think those two aspects are balanced when it comes to Wakanda's world building? And maybe how does that speak to the genre of Afrofuturism as a whole? Maybe Antoine, you wanna go ahead? Well, I love the idea of that because even like some of the concept art that we were watching during the video, you know, you see, how buildings are sort of built around the environment rather than yeah. over it or like de- mm. demolishing it, um, which is, I, there's a term for, I think it's ecology or ecologic. I don't know what it's called, but it's like the melding of, you know, um, infrastructure with the natural environment. You see that a lot in like fantasy with like elves and stuff like that. They're, they'll build around, they'll build a tree, hatch, um, tree houses around their trees instead of like, you know, taking the trees down. So I think that idea of it, it is really nice. Um, and also, yeah, the, the, the two worlds of, of holding on to the, old traditions but then still being the progressive forefront of of progress in terms of like technology or anything like that i think it's it's represented very well with wakanda and also in the idea of afrofuturism the idea of how we can move forward you know and and hold on you know to what we have without demolishing it or or erasing it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean one of the things that i think about when i when i read was specifically when i read this conversation or this question but also just in trying to think of like, okay, how would, you know, what could I compare Wakanda to or like what my vision of Wakanda would be like? And I have to say, it's kind of weird, but I thought of Black Twitter 
as like this mirror of Wakanda. You have this, you have millions, millions of black people all over the world utilizing Twitter to have these conversations. And we say black Twitter because a lot of times it's a lot of things that are very much connected to blackness and not just blackness unique to the US, but blackness um, across the diaspora, right? And so you have this really technologically advanced system to have this conversation with one another about stuff that um that we find interesting that we find funny that are that impacts who we are as a people you know all of that kind of thing and i imagine that that's how it would be in wakanda where you have these different folks with all of these different types of beliefs you know whether it's deeply embedded in um, tradition or hyper you know um advanced technology you have these people kind of mingling with one another and really having these deep conversations and then the question is what happened what what often happens with white white twitter is that um some things are stolen for the greater larger population of whiteness right and how does then how does then black twitter continue to maintain itself in a way that um allows protection for the language for the vision for all of those kinds of things and it really does um and so i imagine that and for me that that's kind of what i imagine how Wakanda would be in some way when we see eventually it open up to the world. Um, we're going to keep a lot of this to ourselves. You get about 5%. Um, That's what I'm really interested in. I want to see how they're going to be doing that because it just got announced that the Wakanda uh, series anthology that um, Ryan Coogler got yeah, Greenway yeah. is going to happen. So it's very interesting to see how the future, because it kind of got stopped, you know, with the whole snapping thing, right? We didn't really right. get that storyline because <laughs> the whole world kind of like stopped for a second. Um, oh, but yeah, yeah, how is that going to look like? And I think that's, that's a pretty big responsibility on those creators of how they're going to depict that because it is going to send a message sort of of how we think the real world you know should kind of navigate from this point on right right <laughs> mm -hmm. like that that um but that, that does kind of touch on um like a lot of things kind of what with with what what like it kind of speaks to how wakanda would or would not navigate colonialism for one um, mm -hmm. and how it would navigate a post-colonial era. Um, mm -hmm. And also like, what, are, what role do Africans have in a world that has, that's done nothing but take from Africa? Mm. Um, like I remember watching the movie feeling like, yeah, yeah, they're right to be hiding away. They're mm -hmm. right to be hiding away. Like knowing mm -hmm. my history, knowing, you know, the 500 plus years of, <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's, 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 I, I, I'm with you, Antoine. I think it's fascinating to see where they're going to take it moving forward um, and how they chart it in, in this world. Um, like one, one of the more interesting things I thought about, like the way they created their world was like the intertribal cooperation um, and kind of like how they can navigate that in the world we're in today that doesn't necessarily value that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, the thing about tradition and futurism is fascinating, though. Mm -hmm. um, like that's, I feel like that's a tension that just like cuts through like every society in a variety of ways. But it's like I think it's particularly acute in uh, in Western culture because like mass white culture has done a really good job of erasing history. Like mm -hmm. both the kind of like sides they weren't necessarily proud of, but also mm -hmm. like the indigenous people here in Canada. Um, and it's like without tradition how do you have a future right mm -hmm. like, 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 like i've got a quote here where it's like you look back to look forward like that, that's kind of like how we we progress as a society and the civilization as people right so you look yeah. back you know look at the ancestors what are they done move forward with whatever's going on today but by destroying the past or like what of what of where, where where can we go um so it, it, it's definitely like a, a wild tension. I think it's really interesting that most indigenous cultures, because I'd like to group um, like Afrofuturism within the tradition of indigeneity, um, because mm -hmm. it's, it, it, these are global responses mm -hmm. to a system that was foisted on everyone that does not speak to the lived realities of most people around the world. 
Um, so like Antoine, your point about like architecture, the first thing I thought of was this like, I think it was human planet, not planet earth from like a decade ago, these like dudes in India who were like growing a bridge that took like a thousand years to grow because it was literally a tree across a river. Mm -hmm. it's like it's a, it's a tree bridge that they like, and it's like this dude's job was to like look after this bridge. And I'm thinking like, whoa, 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 my guy. Like you're, you're like, you, literally you're not gonna see anything happen. The tree's never gonna grow visibly in your lifetime, but somehow you've like managed to convince yourself that this is like, a, like this is what you're doing with your life. Whereas mm -hmm. here in like our culture, we're like, no, no, you must achieve, accomplish, do things now. And right. like this guy just like got this tree going across a river. And it's like, that's a really, really interesting way of interpreting like architecture and being in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I actually, like this comment that's right here are, are we okay to like mention comments if they pop up i think it was the question comment i believe so it wasn't a question it was just uh it was in the the, the panelists and attendees the um the gentleman here about the medium of film yeah. oh yeah so i thought it was an interesting point I, I just before you answer that i think it's a great question but i just want to tell the attendees if you have any questions feel free to type them in the q a function uh, that way it'll be a lot easier because of the ways things get lost in the chat because people like to contribute. So if you do have a question for the panelists, I think this one is a really good one, uh, then just feel free to put it in the, the Q&A. But yeah, inform, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. So he says, does the medium of film bring the vision closer to life compared to previous textbooks or graphic novels and cartoon mediums? And I thought that was interesting in particular because we were talking about the idea of um, oral tradition and how we're kind of, because of visual mediums um, like film and TV, we're kind of reverting back to that, but with technology, right? So yeah. it's still like in the play of the Afrofuturism where it's like, that is our first way of understanding story or sharing stories uh and text is kind of a newer thing it's kind of like a middle portion of human history and now we're kind of reverting back to that because as you can see with most people you know they they go to even me being a novelist like it's like yeah most people are like where's the movie or like what's the tv adaptation like people are always asking for like the video where's the visual that sort of a thing and i thought it was very interesting um and i think the importance of that i i, I want to touch on like the importance of, of film because of that reason uh and, and for whatever reason it's more engaging for us to, to interact with you know visual auditorial um mediums well it's kind of where podcasts come in too right right uh, and like i think that's uh, like a really really interesting opportunity moving forward um for like afrofuturist voices right um, where like with the podcast, you're just telling a story. You're just telling a story in your voice, with your tone, with your, you know, if you get a good sound editor, then you, <laughs> um, you, you can really, really create an immersive experience. Or yeah. audiobook, same, similar, you know, where you yeah. have like sound effects and music, like same, very yeah. similar to old uh, griots who would have, you know, the mm -hmm. music playing in the background while they're doing the story. It's, well, it's, it's, it's like, full circle. Know, Exactly, because like, you know, for thousands of years, how are we telling stories? It was around the fire with like mm -hmm. crackling in the background, chattering in the background, maybe some drum beats, like, like that's how it always was. It was about like, mm -hmm. not just like, it's like, it, it's it's totally like really wild to me that like for, you know, like since the, the white people decided that we must read and write and that's like the objective truth is, is, is written and mm -hmm. read, um, mm -hmm. it's been like 200 years since they decided that. Like all they've done is give us these fucking books that are just like words on pages, words on pages, words on pages, words on pages. And you're like, okay, true. Like, that's not how I learn. Like I'm literally gonna like hold up a freaking book here. And it's like, who gives, who, like, what is this? What is this madness? You know, like that is in no way like engaging to the human unless you're like a very specific type of human. That's like a small minority of people that can internalize like, like, like you know, information that way, right? Mm -hmm. um so the fact that we're in a space now where we can actually communicate these messages across all the like across um like borders the way we can it's 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 really really empowering you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely I, I i think what i i love that that uh question too because for me um i always think about the ways in which you know which, which you brought up too um she was like how do we learn like mm -hmm. we you know i feel like i definitely learn through visuals and i think that that um although i'm a huge reader and an author as well and so it's like when people are like um hey so like you were saying, uh, Antoine, about like movies, it's mostly like, hey, when are when is it gonna be a you know audio book? It's like uh, <laughs> not anytime soon. That's expensive. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, just like people, we have this world where people are moving so fast, and so books are not they're they're becoming this really novel thing now, which is so weird. Literally, no. it's like <laughs> it's like. <laughs> 
you have a book? It's, yes, actually have <laughs> yeah. a piece of paper, the bunch of papers folded together. Yes, I yeah. agree with that. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with film because I love film. I think it's amazing, but I do think that um, there are places for that type of uh, medium. But I do also think, because we, we, me and Rashid were talking about this earlier, you know, how do we capture the stories that will never get um, mm -hmm. a moment to have their moment on film, right? How do we capture? And, and really it is about writing and taking the time to kind of, you know, help this narrative move forward because there's so many people who, you know, we have these histories with that will never get that opportunity. And that's what makes, I think, Wakanda so amazing because it feels like there's, there's not only technology, but as you all were talking about this oral tradition that's going to keep going because of the technology, which is sort of strange, but it's like, clubhouse to some extent if any of you have are on clubhouse um but it's, so it's like all this you know narrative this verbal narrative and you know no images which is kind of cool it's kind of like lyrics too in a song right like yeah, you, yeah. You re if you just read it without knowing what the song is or what the music is or anything like that if you just read it sometimes it's kind of like okay like uh, cool words you know but then once you get the performer behind it it's a whole different kind of scenario similar with people who right. say they don't understand Shakespeare when they read it but when mm -hmm. it's performed and, you, yeah. and, you, and you're like oh even though you don't understand the words maybe completely you, you get the meaning behind them because there's someone giving it life so th mm -hmm. there is that benefit of, of, of that portion of it. Well it's because right. th there's like a, a thousand ways to learn right and mm -hmm. you know I think part of what we're doing as like, Afrofuturist authors historians researchers and like students is like we're telling stories the way we want to tell them, mm -hmm. um, which is really powerful because we were told stories a certain way. Yeah. Because there's only one way to learn, right? It's like, you know, you sit, you sit in that desk, take notes and you, you, you follow the instructions. Um, and like, we're, we're touching on how there's actually way more different ways to do, to do that. And, you mm -hmm. know, the important thing is to kind of build on that tradition now, right? Where, you know, we're more empowered than we've ever been. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, it's time to, 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 to build from that. Uh, mm -hmm. Like how do, how do we how do we empower more people? How do we have more people who believe they can tell stories their way? And how do we make it legitimate, right? Yeah. Like where do we get legitimacy from for for this, right? It's like the, the schools still have their way of educating people. You still got to go along their treadmill to mm -hmm. get their pieces of paper their way, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, that reminds me of an earlier conversation that you and I have received about like history is so freaking amazing. Like history is 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 a is is amazing. It's it's bloody. It's sad. It's tragic. It's amazing. It's like it, there's love. There's hate. There's all kinds of things in it. And all people usually get are like names and dates. Mm -hmm. like, right. There, it's it's stories. It's that, not right? names and dates. It's just like names and dates. Not anything about what actually happened. How did this unfold? You know. I mean, and none the of that. reason it unfolded. The like reason, that, you know, all that. You know, none of that. I mean, it's just like you know. No, this this yeah. man did this thing this one time, and then this yeah. man did this thing, and then this man did this thing. But it's like the the histories that we were taught and this is like mm -hmm. basically a global problem like yeah. it's like there's a collective global issue here history was taught to all of us by white men mm -hmm. who were born in the 1800s in either right. england germany france or the united states of america those four countries white men born in those places mm -hmm. wrote down the histories of everybody and then told mm -hmm. us that's what the game is the game is mm -hmm. like I was, I was this is like BBC Africa thing. It's like a ten part documentary series in the history of Africa. I'm like partly mm -hmm. through it right now. Um, the episode on Egypt is wicked, um, and like it opens with this like it's like look like the ancient Egyptians were black. Like don't have a one. Like don't have a two ways. They were black. They were black. <laughs> they were black. They were black. And like get it out of your mind that they were even close to brown, let alone white. They were black. Right. Like all of the first kings of Egypt for the first like thousand years were from the south. They were from the south of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, layered in another point, like Egypt did not become a multicultural Mediterranean society until, you know, the Greeks and Romans got there thousands of years later. And that's why they're brown now. And I'm like, yep, okay, yep, that tracks. And then they're like, yeah. So when you look at the pyramids, um, like the way they would like, like uh, the hieroglyphs, right? They'd like draw, like when they were like drawing on, on, on the walls, um, the red ochre paint they were using, that was how they expressed tones of blackness. 
mm. with the red mm-hmm. ochre paint. When you look at it, there's shades of red ochreness, and that's for the blackness. So mm-hmm. it's like, of course, the fucking white men in the 1800s who were white, who were writing down these histories were like, nah, 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 nah. They, at minimum, they had to be, they had to be like Arab looking brown. There's no way the Egyptians were black. Right. right. You know, but so <laughs> that's why we have to, like, you know, decolonize our histories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, and when you have. Uh, history books being kind of written in the U.S. with this ideology of like, oh, um, black folks were immigrants and mm. they came to help with help with it. It's like, no, there were black people from, you know, East Africa who were enslaved. Right? Yeah, I've never <laughs> seen that before. I've never. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> it's it's also like this like giant like am, am, amnesiac shame almost. Yeah. Like, like Africa has like, like in the 150 years or so of like teaching people what the hell the world is, Africa has been kind of created as this avatar, this avatar to project all of our fears and anxieties onto. Mm-hmm. And it's not a real place. It's an imagined place in our minds, like Africa. And part of it is shameful. Like Africa can't be capable of anything. You know, that's why the Egyptians can't be black. You can't have a great civilization from Africa. That's not allowed. No, no, no. Africa is where we take stuff from. Mm-hmm. Um, and like uh, there was a really big thing like I was uh, like reading up on Marcus Garvey and it's like mm-hmm. he was taught to hate Africa and to be ashamed of being from Africa mm-hmm. you know it's like mm-hmm. he ha- like, mm-hmm. like, <laughs> that's crazy it's I, so mean, crazy. I mean I think that relates just back to what Stephanie was saying earlier why Wakanda is so novel it's because of course it's a nation that's been untouched by these atrocities like colonialism and slavery so I think that's perhaps a good segue and what Rashid was already signaling at to discuss maybe how Wakanda specifically subverts these unhelpful and harmful stereotypes that we usually associate with Africa, whether economically or socially or historically, and perhaps how Wakanda can serve as inspiration for other fictional settings there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, it's... Um... Like, it, it, it really does provide a challenge to this, like, uh, conception we have for, you know, what I was taught, the dark continent, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, like, what, what, what Africa can do um, in a war, because, <laughs> like, part of the, part of, part of this, like, one of the things I'm working on right now is a story about my family, um, my dad's side of the family from East Africa, and we're Swahili's, and within the framework of, like, you know, ethno-nationalism, um, my dad's Kenya. Like mm-hmm. My dad was my age, Kenya just became a country. In the mm-hmm. country of Kenya, there's 44 million people. The, you know, the Swahilis, who are a small little tribe, 200,000 Swahilis, you know, the dominant ethnic group there, the Kikuyus, is like, you know, something like 19 million or something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like, we, we are just a drop in the water of, you know, dozens and dozens of different ethnic groups in this country called Kenya. Um, and like, that, that's, that's like a, a really, really fascinating reality for African countries to kind of like confront and Wakanda's definitely given them I, I wouldn't say I, I'd say like a bit of hope for sure and like a, a potential roadmap right where it's like look this is a multi-ethnic state that does work we can like we, we, you, you basically, we've basically been given all these all these nation states that have to be multi-ethnic without a roadmap that says this is how it works mm-hmm. um and like that's that, that very is, similar to Nigeria too where Nigeria mm-hmm. has a bunch of eth- uh, ethnic groups and you would think you look at a map oh no Nigeria is on Nigeria it's like no there's like like I think dozens and dozens of ethno groups. I mean, there's like three major ones. There's the Igbo, there's the Yoruba, and then the House of Fulani. But like, there's there's multiple, and you can't just put a you know imaginary line around that. And even splitting some of those people groups, uh, you know, with those borders, and expect mm-hmm. them to you know get along. Like they don't have they have different uh, traditions and different kinds of cultures. It's no, not it's, like you can just group them. Yeah, it's wild. It's like the way I love to describe it is um, like if anyone's familiar with former Yugoslavia in Europe. Like former Yugoslavia, where you've got Bosnia, Serbia, and like all, and then like Croatia, Slovenia, and like you know some like tw- like eight, ten different countries in this area, like that that they they fought for their ethno nationalist nation states, mm-hmm. and they've now got their ethnic. Like, the like, if you look at the African map, you've got a you've got Swaziland, you've got Lesotho, you've got Namibia, 
as, as like or not the Botswana, which are like almost ethno nationalists. Like as in like they they have the one ethnicity that's in the whole. Their state. borders are actually yeah. you know yeah. appropriate. So like, you know, on the other hand, you could take Rwanda, which has two ethnic groups, and we saw how that turned out, right? And mm -hmm. like the thing is, it's like the nation state is something that the Europeans created in Europe for Europeans, and they fought for it in Europe against each other for their rights to have nation states for themselves. And then they went to the rest of the world and they're like, hey world, how about it? How about, how about you have this? Like, hey Middle East, how about that? Hey Southeast Asia, how about that? Hey India, how's it going? Like, you know, like, like it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's one of the, 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 the tragedies of history, but it's also given uh, the, the global, like a, the, the non-Western world, a really, really tremendous opportunity to imagine a better world. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing that I'm like really, really inspired by. Like I was, I was reading up on the history of the Swahili coast last week. And like essentially if colonialism didn't happen and say the Swahilis were allowed to form a nation state in the way that the Europeans were, the Swahili coast stretches from Somalia all the way down to Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And it would be a country about, it would look like Chile just on the East coast of Africa because culturally everyone up and down that coast was tra trading with people in India and in China and Arabia. Like that, that's kind of like um, what it would have been. So it's, it's fascinating for me to kind of like try and reimagine worlds like, like that um, and how, how different the world could be because part of the Swahili ethnos, like part of the Swahili state was, it was really multicultural. It was like everyone was from everywhere. And that was part of the, part of the agreement, part of the ethic was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, you're from like Philippines. Cool. Oh, you're from Indonesia. Cool. Or like what would have been Malay or, you know, I guess it's like, that's, that's, that's an example of how the world can be. Whereas like the Europeans who created these things were like, yeah, bro, like this is France for French. This is Belgium for the Belgians. What's a Belgian? Like, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's an opportunity here. Right, right, right. And, and, you know, in thinking about that, it's like, this is one of the, I think one of the tensions sometimes between um, Afrofuturists who spend most of their time or grew up in Africa versus Afrofuturists who live in other parts of the diaspora and particularly mm. In the U.S., mm. there is an, an occasional tension around what does, if we are talking about Afrofuturism, does that mean that um, all of your work should be placed within Africa, right, the continent of Africa? And for me, well, while Wakanda was beautiful and I thought so much about like what this, what would this look like for, you know, a country in the continent to have not been touched by colonialism? What would that look like even for the whole continent if it had not been touched by colonialism? But I mean, in my imagination, I can only go as far as Wakanda, right? Because I've never lived in Africa. I have no connection other than through maybe friends or through what I've you know, seen on television, both the really um, propagandist kind of, you know, stuff that you see late at night about, you know, you have to give this dollar and all of that kind of stuff to the actual, like, to the actual somewhat, you know, it's the, the actual reality of what um, African, uh, the African continent has in terms of you know, wealth in terms of, you know, people and all of that kind of stuff. So I can only imagine so much in terms of Wakanda, but in my own, in my own work, in my own society, I have to imagine a world where I grew up. That doesn't mean I can't stretch my mind, but I can't really even imagine something that would place me within an African context because I've never been there, right? I've never been there. I've never lived there. Um, and so I don't know, right? Um, and so I think that that's an interesting tension because when we're thinking about, you know, how, what would it look like if, you know, if, uh, if Africa wasn't touched by colonialism, well, what would it look like for me um, as a Black American if, for instance, Tulsa uh, remained unburned, <laughs> if Roosevelt right. remained unburned, mm -hmm. if, you know, if all of these, if Harlem remained, you know, uh, essential to a, like a black uh, community, like how would that look for me, right? And I think that that's, um, that's where for me, you know, you begin to write around, you know, kind of breaking through these, um, these uh, kind of stereotypes and all of that kind of stuff. And that's what we can do for me in exchange of knowledge. Um, what would it look like if these areas of the U.S. 
had not been trampled on by white racism, right? Um, versus having a con conversation with someone who is from the continent and they can say, yeah, you know, this is how I imagine my space not having been colonialized, right? So I think that there's an opportunity for an exchange of conversation. And I think in some ways, Black Panther kind of opened that. Um, yeah, it kind of opened that. And it's kind of been in throughout the history of like Black Americans in particular, it's kind of been that way because we've had to remix what our ancestors have done already. So that's either through music or language, for instance. Like Ebonics is, well, I don't even know those call Ebonics anymore. I think it's a AAVE now, I think is the is the term for it. But mm -hmm. it's it's the idea of that was our previous grammar and we're just adapting it to uh, adapting it to this new language or uh, uh, similar religions like like the religions of, of Ifa coming and, and integrating with Catholicism and becoming like, oh, the saints are also the Orishas at the same time. Like we always are are remixing it or even just uh, any of the patois, the Creole that's all over, you know, that's all just hints of our history that are just being implanted and remixed. And that's kind of how we've been navigating, you know, being in the diaspora is just remixing <laughs> what our, and, and even though if we don't know it actively, it's still in our, our bloodline or even in the way that, you know, we talk or the way that we interact with each other or some of the culture stuff that we have are just carryovers. And it's just good to remind ourselves that we're just trying to and have been like, even if it isn't um, a, a active thought, it's a subconscious thought that we've been actively trying to get back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that face that um, for most of us who haven't, you know, lived on the continent or can't even trace ourselves back to the continent, that is the thing, right? It's, and I think for me, that was the thing when I watched Black Panther was like, this possibly will be the only time where I can place myself within this space and feel like I am a part of um, a continent of people who I can, I, I don't know familiarly, but it feels like a familiar relationship, right? Um, and then it opens up that door for, you know, more conversation for really kind of taking apart some of the parts of the movie that um, really needed discussion. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. In particular, with having Killmonger as as yes. a opposing force, and yes. also sort of representing like the Black American experience. Yeah. Granted, mm -hmm. maybe like the darker ends of it, like it's if uh, if it's like it could be like a, a, a sequel to Fruitvale, right? Like let's say like yeah. he survives and then he actually becomes Killmonger, kind of a thing, and like yeah. how that turmoil and how that darkness can be unleashed in a, in a bad way. And I like that it's sort of a cautionary tale against that, and that it's represented there. Well, the Killmonger thing is really interesting too. Um, in like, uh, so like you know, the country Liberia was created by like a society, like it was a white society in the 1850s who were like, yo, let's like create a colony in Africa to send it and to send black people back to. Um, and like, fascinatingly, when Black Americans end up going to Liberia, it it did not work because the values, the values, the values are different by then. Mm -hmm. Whereas like once you like, like once you've been like once you're in North America, that's where you are, that's where you're from. You're part of that culture. And like there's there's, there's something really, really fascinating kind of a, about like global blackness, right? Mm -hmm. Like I I'd be I'd be especially curious about like maybe like a Brazilian perspective too. Right. Um, yeah. On 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 what blackness means in Brazil. Right. Um where it's like um I think it's uh, um uh, what's her name? Uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie had a thing about uh, how. Who is that? Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. No, I mean, who? Who uh, is she? Oh, she wrote Americana. Uh, she's an author, oh, gotcha. Nigerian author. Um, and like she wrote about how in Nigeria, you know, you're Igbo or like you, you, you're not. There's no such thing as black in Nigeria. There's, there's, there's no such thing as black and it's not yeah. even I mean it's a little bit Nigerian but also you're usually going to be talking about your people group first so you're yeah, going to say exactly. I'm Yoruba I'm Igbo I'm Hausa exactly. like you're not going to necessarily say Nigerian first but then she spoke in <laughs> unless you're outside of Nigeria okay. and, then, and then she literally spoke to this in her book Americana which I couldn't like I'd recommend it anyway it's a brilliant brilliant book and it's like as soon as her character gets to America she's suddenly black and she's labeled as black mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she has to confront, and, and then she has a line about how she had to then take on the 400 years of baggage of North American blackness. Mm -hmm. All I, I, that, that, that came onto her because, you know, as soon as you're a black person in America, you're a black person in America. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter where the crap you came from, whatever your history was, is out the door. You're now a black person in America and you're part of that tradition because that's how, that's, that's how American society sees you. 
There was a YouTube uh, channel called Cut. Well, they're, they're still around and they deleted this video uh, since it came out, but it was like the idea of like, let's rate the blackness of these like black oh people. And there was a gentleman from Nigeria who came over and um, they didn't even like, he said the oh, same thing what you're saying with her is that she, when he came over, like or when he's in Nigeria, I wasn't black. I was just, I was just there. I was just a person, you know what I mean? And it's not until you come over that you're like, oh, now I get what like, you know, what it means to be like black. Like, I, like he's heard of it before. Like he's heard the term, you know, on in media or whatever, but he didn't really get it until he came to the States. Well, it's like, even you can see with Obama, right? Like part, part of the narrative around Obama was, is he black enough? Or it, 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 like, um, like even, even like in, in um, and I guess it's a pathology of, of slavery, of course. And it's like in, in Jamaican society, one of the things was, it was like, it was, was kind of like a race-based quota where it's like, the lighter your skin, the more privileges you were given. So the darker your skin got, the worse it got, and the worse it got, and the worse it got, and the worse it got. Um, so it's like, there's, there, there's this like deep inheritance. It's all from the, the power structure. Of white and supremacy. racism is crazy. Like uh, what you were yeah. saying before about like the, the white men who created this in the 17 and 1800s is that it is like possibly the most effective caste system ever because it's, a, it's so visual and quick, you know, like it's just like, oh yeah, that, that person's on my team. That person's not on my team, which was not part of human history yeah. until the last 400, 500 years, you know what well, I mean? Which is here's, insane. Here's where it gets so dark and nefarious, right? There's this wicked book by, uh, her name's Nell Irvin Painter, um, and it's called A History of White People. And it is an ethnography of Western cultures, conceptions of other. So it starts with like how they talk about barbarians back in Roman times. Like the barbarians were like this, that, and the other. Um, and it centers on this Western beauty ideal in the 1800s when the idea of whiteness was invented. And mm -hmm. whiteness was invented specifically in America by the white upper class so that the poor white lower classes didn't rise up against them, mm -hmm. literally. Something was, similar to what we were experiencing over the past few years, I would say, <laughs> quite possibly. It, 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 it's a legacy of it, right? It's like this, this system was created 200 years ago so that all these poor white people who were getting fucked over by capitalism all the same, mm -hmm. fucked over by mm -hmm. a system that only empowers 1%, all the same, it told those poor white people, no, 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 at least you ain't black. Yeah. You're good, you're not black. You're good. You're good. You're not black. Right. It doesn't matter that like you are essentially an indentured laborer and you are living in an indentured poverty system that's going to keep you poor and now like addicted to opioids today. But it's like, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that um, Antoine, when you brought up Killmonger, that that reminded me so much of like watching the film where I was like, this is a door to having conversations hmm. with african immigrants about the u.s experience of blackness and like you know um some of my friends who are from different parts of africa are like yeah you know kind of like the way uh we see these movies about y'all over here you know and you're lazy and this and that it's like yeah <laughs> you, you would hear you hear that you hear that, <laughs> you hear that a lot from uh, uh some african families where they'll, they'll tell their their daughters and sons hey don't get with any yeah. black american because they're supposed to be wild or something you know what i mean like that that perception yeah. is even there not just to white people and every other kind of race but our own our own motherland you know right, right. But, it's like, but it's like that that goes back to the minstrel shows right like and who's who's been who's been making who's been making the media who's been controlling the message and mm -hmm. for why and for what right Mm -hmm. like, like, like that's always been 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 and that's why you know from essentially jordan peele to black panther to things like lovecraft country mm -hmm. to kind of bring that into the discussion too it's like that's why having control over the story being able to tell your own story is so important mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. where you you're centering yourself in the narrative now you're not you know a stereotype you're not um like this, this uh th this figure of fancy to be made fun of or to be feared you're right. actually a person because right. like it's like, you know, like basically until Black Panther, the only black stories you could tell in America were homies on the porch or slavery. Yeah, was it. it was maybe, interesting. Maybe There's just been it. ebb and flows, right? Because I yeah. feel like there was a renaissance in the 90s where you had like, you know, um, Living Single and Martin mm -hmm. and all these other things. So you got to mm -hmm. see that black people weren't a monolith and that we were mm. all individual people like you know you have you have urkel you know you have like oh there's nerdy black people too it's like yeah i've existed like forever yeah. uh, like donald glover said it was illegal to be a black nerd until oh, 2000, uh, 2003 oh, right God. so so it's like it, it's been like the case of we've had these um 
heels of opportunity and progress that kind of yeah. dip occasionally, right? And yeah. I'm just hoping that the one that we're on now is, mm. is sustained rather than it just being another heel that goes like, oh, remember like when we had that back in the day and, and yeah. when are we gonna have that again, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I, want, I would I love to see it sustain. I wanna give a quick shout out to the original run of the Boondocks. Um, and oh, like yes. The Wait, what do you mean original run? Is there an, another one coming or something? They, they like did like another season a few years oh, ago. Oh, okay, okay. Like, <laughs> um, but, it's, but like um, bringing up kind of like uh, and a futurist narrative centered in North America. Um, like when you brought up, when you brought that up, I immediately thought of the Boondocks episode where Martin Luther King doesn't die. Oh, and right. I found that to be one of the most, like that was foundational for me and like, I still consider it one of the most powerful bits of media I've consumed. Yeah. Because like, it, it, it is Afrofuturism. It's like, and like the Rodney McGrude is a black guy. And like the mm -hmm. centering, like the whole story is what if he didn't die? What if he didn't die? You know? And, and it, it, takes, it takes that story, it looks at American culture and it's not a very, very good look at American mm -hmm. culture of how things have moved in the 30 plus years. And you know, it, it kind of ends with Martin Luther King or- I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, like that, that, They'll be up there with you. <laughs> there you go. I mean, I think to that effect, we're getting a lot of interesting questions uh, in the Q and A here, perhaps examining some of the shortcomings uh, when it comes to representation or, you know, being conscious that simply uh, powerful or a single powerful uh, image uh, is not enough and it needs to inspire some trends. So there are a few things people brought up here. One was that perhaps is it potentially problematic that even though Wakanda is quite autonomous uh, and you know powerful, they are still fundamentally owned by corporate interests because of vibranium as a resource. And then there's this, this other one. Uh, the oh, so like, thoughts on that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to that one, but uh, <laughs> just this other one. Disney this... Corporation, Disney made the movie. The, exactly, that and the, the very film, just the ending of the film where it was uh, Martin Freeman's character who technically saved the day. And I, I read this sort of very facetious uh, summary of the premise of Black Panther. Someone said it pointedly to make a remark. Uh, it was a movie about a CIA agent that restored the rightful monarch to an African throne. So you can obviously see uh, there are some potentially negative interpretations when it comes to representation as well. So maybe I'd, I'd be curious to hear. I actually interpret that on. specific thing uh, differently. Uh, and that's more of we need the help to actually push through. And it was more mm -hmm. of him helping along rather than him taking over and saving the day. Because there have been moments where there have been like the white savior uh, trope. I don't think that plays in Black Panther necessarily. Sorry, my light just went out. Um, so in that one in particular, I disagree with um, I in would, terms I, of like I, that yeah. specific moment. Um, but I, I do recognize that that has happened. Like, um, what was the one? hidden figures? There was definitely white, white trope uh, stuff in there. And all the time, what the one with, um, I can't remember the lady's name, the football movie, like the, it's happened before. Oh, oh, the blind side? Yeah, that's what it was, the blind side, yeah. yeah. Sandra Bullock, she's gonna save us. <laughs> <laughs> I do think yeah. though that the ending is complicated. I mean, it's, I, I I initially I was not critical of it. I in the in the few other times that I watched it, I sort of became a little bit more critical of it, especially considering the relationship between the CIA and the black community <laughs> in mm. the U.S. Uh, it's 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 pretty complicated. Um, I had a couple of people then send me um, some things about the way. Um, the CIA um, kind of looks at different movies and things like that. And I thought that was really interesting, but I was, I, I was a little frustrated about the end. And I know that there are some people that I've talked to that are like, ah, you know, it's not, that's not a big deal. The point is that this happened and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but at the same time, did he have to be the one to shoot down the, um, the, the planes, could it have been Shuri? Could it have been somebody else? I mean, why did he play such an important piece at the end? And I think that is, that's one of the things that's complicated for me in terms of not only the movie, but also in thinking about, um, in, in my day job, I do diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And I begin to think about something that what you said, Antoine, is that for us to be on a particular journey together, do we need 
um, white folks to be on the same page with us. And, uh, and, and it's a yes. And also, again, we're going back to it's complicated. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's like the, the idea from Malcolm X, right? Like the, that yeah. famous um, uh, anecdote he had about, I uh, think it was a rally he did or something. And then a white uh, liberal woman came up and said, you know, what can I do as a white woman to help? And he's like, not a damn thing. But then later on in his career, when he, you know, had his, he uh, uh, did the right of passage and everything, he was like, actually, I think I would have gone back and said, you know what, like, this is what you could have done, you know, instead of it being a complete like, no, you stay away from me entirely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's it's interesting. Um, I, I I I I I agree with the critiques to to a certain extent as well. Um, but I just kind of had a thought where it's like, okay, so Black Panther, right? Rightfully, like, every movie deserves a critique. But like, why ain't nobody critiquing like Captain America for being a for being Captain America? You know, mm-hmm. like 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 why is it the Black Panther has this standard to to to, to live up to? You know, it's like the same thing with Obama. It's like he had the different standard to live up to, where it's like the amount of crit- like it's, it's it's like and, and then like you know the criticism is fascinating especially when it comes from white culture and it's like mm-hmm. okay but like whose standard are we playing with here and like yeah it is like you know wh- why why did the white guy have to shoot down the planes i mean you know we got to work together we got to help each other at the same time like there's a, there is a weird thing about like there's got to be a way in for white audiences mm-hmm. with movies, um and with um like non-white media there's always there's always like like that 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 more neutral character that'll bring that'll that's that's literally there to to like assuage the white audience and make them feel okay um and kind of like that's what he was there for in a sense right and by him playing the hero role could you could you argue that maybe he was there so the white people could feel they were involved in that story you know yeah i mean i think the other part <laughs> it kind of makes me laugh as you brought up it was brought up uh former president obama and uh one of the things i used to say when i would hear criticism from both black folks and white folks was you know we elected the worst black student union president ever i mean like <laughs> because black people were so upset with him um around a lot and and, and sometimes rightfully so around some of the things that he was doing around blackness but then white people would get upset because he did a little something for blackness it's just like right yeah he is not the president of the black student union (laughs) he's the president of the united states of america with all kinds of restrictions and things like that um but it's like to, to the Americans, he's just the president for the blacks, though, right? right exactly. that, that, that's that's what that's the optics, and that's kind of it's interesting because he uh, same with Obama being mixed race, right? Like that's kind yeah. of the issue in part, right? Because you don't, you're never good enough for either side. And you're always in like this middle road kind of situation. And his presidency kind of was that for you know the whole entire time. <laughs> I also just think like I, I didn't I, I guess in terms of the movie like with um the CIA agent kind of sort of saving the day I kind of wish he just wasn't a CIA agent I yeah. would have been cool if it had been you know spoiler alert winter soldier like or some somehow That's true that would have been cool yeah. if it was, it was him <laughs> okay great Lucky would have been much better <laughs> <laughs> Especially given the CIA's history with, uh, say, the, you know, actual Black Panthers. Right, exactly. That is the thing. I think that was the thing that frustrated me the most. It's not yeah, that... Fred was, Hampton's not about this. Yeah, yeah. It's not that he was um, a white guy, although that that is troubling in its own self around colonization, but it, the CIA point was the thing of, like, the actual Black Panthers, though. There's a history there, you know? Um, yeah, so... It's, it's definitely one of those things that that's a little troubling about the movie, but as someone in, in the chat said, like, it doesn't stop me from watching it. I, I still mm-hmm. love it. I still see so many more things that I can, you know, talk with friends about that have nothing to do with the white guy at the end. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I guess part and parcel with that, we're getting a lot of questions uh, about the portrayal of Killmonger and his motivations in particular and how that compares to T'Challa's and whether or not those two perspectives, which each character represents, are fleshed out uh, as well as they could be. So I'm just curious to hear everyone's general thoughts on that. Well, I think the original cut of the movie was like four hours, right? Something like that. Yeah. So to, to answer that, I guess that oh. in part, uh, oh. no, it wasn't as fleshed out as it could have been. But considering, like, considering how you have to consolidate a movie to like two and a half hours, which it still was even a long movie in that regard, um, and some of the deleted scenes you, you watch, like there was one with... Um, 
Akoya and um and her and her her her, her boo. I forget his name. Uh, the Rhino Daniel guy. Daniel um, yeah. One of no, not Daniel Kaluuya. Like like I mean that's that's a I mean that's yeah. his that's the, the actor's name. But I forget the forget the, the Wakabi Wakabi I think Wakabi. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So like there was a crazy lead scene between them that I was like that that needed to be in the movie. You know like so so in that way I would say no, it's not developed as much as it could have been or or delved in as much, but it at least had the foundation that it needed to be there just to have a conversation start around that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think the thing about Killmonger is, um, so one of the things that I am very, I, I'm not as upset about the way in which Killmonger was kind of written because um, it's within this kind of black, um, you know, black, uh, perspective, right? So it's like from a Black American perspective, this is, as one of you all said earlier, I think it was Anton said earlier, is like, this is the extreme of what can right. happen in a society that it's full on oppressive, right? Um, and this is what can happen. So he's like the, you know, <laughs> the- Well, it's like a reality, right? Because think right? about the Black Panther movement in, in the States that got broken up. What came of that? Mm -hmm. very very many gangs a lot of drugs right so it's very similar to come on he became part of the biggest gang you know he started working for the u.s government so oh, it's that yeah. same sort of um illusion to that so like you know the, the inverse of that is that if there's no leadership there's if there's no tradition if there's no looking back there's no um guidance then yeah. this is what you're gonna get right here you know and we've seen it in history like we we, we have it the reality of the black panther party and what came of that mm -hmm. and, and i think a, a big thing to touch on is his rage yeah, the rage of Killmonger was was something that they they really emphasized, um, which like I found to both be like startling but justified. Um, I don't know about the two of you, but I, I kind of empathized with him. Oh no, definitely you have to. More so <laughs> than I did with T'Challa. <laughs> yeah, so when he's at the end, he's saying, I mean, granted, like the things that he's proposing, I don't think any of us would would agree with. But in terms of the catharsis that got him there like i think any of us could be like yeah i felt that way too like you know i just want everybody just to, like i remember when i first watched roots uh when i was in middle school or uh elementary school that whole week i hated every white person i saw like that's not of course the right way to go about it like um for instance i had a, a experience in japan uh before the pandemic uh when i traveled there there's a gentleman there who was from new zealand or something right um and he it was a halloween so he was dressed up as I didn't know what he was dressed up. I was like, oh, hey, are you a soccer player? He's like, oh, no, rugby. And he's like, what are you dressed up as, as a black guy? I could easily <laughs> lash out in that moment, right? And, and, and do that sort of a thing. But instead, I spoke to that person and, 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 and educated him or just made him know that, like, dude, I'm just like a regular dude. I'm not like, you know, just I'm dressed up as a black guy kind of thing. So it's that idea of, yes, having that feeling letting it release and release it in a, in a positive way, right? Um, I forget the gentleman's name. Uh, there's a guy who, um, during the height of the Ku Klux Klan, he uh, helped convert a lot, of, uh, a lot of them because he was able to show that, hey, I'm a black guy, I'm not dumb, I'm not a hoodlum, you know, that kind of thing. And just by having conversations with them, he converted many of them to leave the Ku Klux Klan because like, wait, what, who, who are these people I'm hating? I actually did realize I've never had a drink with a black guy before, you know, that sort of a thing, right? So. Yes, totally understand Killmonger where he's come from. I understand that rage. Um, and I can see how if you have all of that and you're dealing with that for a lifetime and you don't have any guidance to do anything better, right. totally understandable. Well, but then the also- you're given are the tools of like a soldier of fortune, you know? So like the right. only way we had to pursue this rage was that of, you know, a tool of the imperialist American government. Right. And so Killmonger for me, because of that it's very complicated because like I get the rage I get it you know if you understand you know the historical context of you know the CIA's relationship with black community the Black Panther Party itself being infiltrated all of those kinds of things I see the rage I get it and yet it's complicated because the relationship that he has to black women within the film is um, startling to say the least. And the, a black woman elder too, that was like, for me, I was mm -hmm. dumb. You know, it was, yeah, I could not. I was like, I understand the rage. And I find that um, the way that he was moving through the space was, 
destructive in itself, destructive for himself um, as an individual, but destructive for the relationships that he could have um, built within that particular society, right? And so you have a society whose um, main goddess is a female woman, uh, you know, type goddess, you know, which grounds black womanhood. And he is basically kind of stomping in and trying to destroy that. Well, he's emblematic of toxic masculinity, isn't it? Yes, yes. And so and the system that, which he grew up in. Like that, right. that, I love that critique in the, in the film because he's doing the same thing that has been done to him, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, not a, it's not a healthy or conducive way to, to progress. Yeah, definitely. But it was, it, so that, that's what makes him complicated, right? And then therein lies just yet another conversation that can be had with black men and black women about, and and this is across the diaspora, about the ways in which we have consumed um, white toxic masculinity and put it and infused it into our communities all over the world. It's not just us in America, it's all over the world and you see it in many different forms. And how can we then, um, you know, eliminate that or figure a way out to uh, be able to, you know, love on people who have been affected, you know, by toxic masculinity, and that's just not women, men too, you know, um, in the ways in which men are taught not to have emotions, are taught not to be connected to one another, all of those kinds of things. It's arguably like, it's arguably tougher for Black men because of the way society puts Black men into a certain kind of box, right, and says the Black men are meant to be this, like, uh, basically Adonis like and stoic and strong and like hyper masculine athletic dominant physical all these things right and the last thing our society says is a black man is meant to be like it's emotional you know and it's like of course this, this applies to white men as well but it was like it's particularly virulent when applied to black men you can look at it with like American football or something like that right mm-hmm. um so no I, I think it's it's, it's really really interesting um, to kind of like center uh, Killmonger's approach in gender, I, I really, I, I think, I think that's uh, that, that's really, really, really fascinating and really um, like enlightening almost. I think, well, even to factor in you saying about like uh, American football, I would say even it's it's more so with with gang culture, you know, because you had the difference of, of the Black Panther Party where they're providers to their communities versus, you know, being aggressors uh, of the community. And I think that's, again, like, the, that's why I love that the movie so much in Killmonger, because it's, it's, he represents so much. And if you don't know all of it, that's still fine. You still get the, 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 gist, the gist of it. But if you really know like the history behind a Killmonger, it's just so much more significant. Right, right. And, and I think when we, t- so I'm going to push back just a little bit on your Rashid in terms of, uh, is it harder for Black men? I think Black men uh, labor is definitely more visible in terms <laughs> of the ways in which black male identity is more visible right and yet i think i reflect on the movie again and think of the ways in which um and this was another thing that i really wanted to um kind of write about when the movie came out but i never got a chance to the ways in which the women in the movie were in many ways kind of debating on um where you have okoye and Mama, Mama Panther, and uh, and uh, the Nakia, Nakia, I think you're thinking Nakia. about, right? And there was a moment when Okoye and Nakia were talking, and Nakia is like, "We got to go," and Okoye is like, "Nope, I am a servant to the throne." Mm-hmm. And in many ways, for me, that was a conversation around: Do we, at all costs, protect blackness, or regardless of you know what's happening over here in terms of blackness, you know this dysfunction over here, do we just protect it? Or do we push against it and say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to do that. And that is a conversation I think that black women are often having around black men. You know, um, I can't remember what his name is, but he had, uh, did the Nat Turner movie and then it came out that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of that. And then people were just like, nope, especially black women were like, nope, I'm done with that. Well, he just came out with a new movie. Movie looks great, but I absolutely am not going to go see that. And it's like, do I protect the blackness or do I protect the, you know, protect 
the what I think is, you know, uh, the protection of of humanity um, in terms of the blackness, right? So I'm not going to, you know, just be like, it's all good because you're black. No, I cannot do that. Right. Um, and I think that that's a conversation that black women have all the time in regards to black men and the ways in which um, black men are treated in society and then how they bring that to the community, how they bring that to the women in their lives and that kind of thing. Um, there's a really great clip of James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni kind of going back and forth. And Nikki Giovanni says to him, you know, uh, I get it that you get kicked, you know, beaten down and spit on by this white dude, but don't bring that home to me. Mm. You know, you say to him, yes, sir, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. You give him all your love, but then you bring your hate home to me. How about you don't do that? <laughs> you know, and so I think that that, that for, for me with the movie itself was another interesting kind of conversation around Killmonger and T'Challa. Are we going to you know, embrace Killmonger because he's on the throne or are we going to follow what we know to be right? Um, what and we, this is sort of Black us. speculative fiction at its best, right? You know, because uh -huh. you have this very fantasy-based movie or sci-fi fantasy movie right? that can touch on all this and, and get all these themes but yeah. have this, you know, this like superhero coding on it, right? Like, I think that's amazing. Yeah. I don't know, like just, just appreciating that in, in general. I think it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, and I love that you brought up Blank Man and Meteor Man earlier, way earlier. Right. <laughs> that those are some like movies that we don't get a lot of conversation around. And yet well, they- Meteor Man in particular too, um, because yeah. there's a message at the end of that movie where it's like, don't wait for a superhero to come and fix your community, you know, like take the responsibility and do it yourself, which I thought was like, whoa, like, like that mm -hmm. scene at the end where everybody's when he lost his powers and they're like, oh, where are you? Where are you? It's like, can you guys just get up and like fight these golden lords yourself? Like I, that movie's amazing. It's so underrated. It's so under, it's cheesy. It's, it's very cheesy, but it's so underrated. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I think that just relates to another thing people have been putting a lot in the chat and a lot of the questions have touched upon the idea of you know shaping narratives, whether it be through art uh, or through uh, history, as many of you were discussing earlier. And there's a, a question earlier from someone who's actually a history teacher, uh, and they were discussing specifically um, how to teach African civilizations on the curriculum. And sort of just to bring this conversation full circle with what we were discussing earlier, uh, how do you all think that um, tools such as you know art media, uh, et cetera, can be used to reshape those traditional narratives and, you know, how can they be most effective? I mean, the reality is that when we are talking about history, we need to kind of kick the history books to the side and really, yeah. use, and this, this, is, this is where we can kind of begin to merge this understanding of technology and, you know, history. Um, there's so many great things out there right now that you don't need a history book because really history books are just like, again, dead, dead folks and, and dates. It's like, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't give you the full rich understanding and it doesn't even challenge you to think. I think you don't get that until you get to university because it wasn't until university that I truly started getting more of what it was considered like the marginal like history, yeah. you know, like I think we just need to insert the university into our public systems or into our, you know, elementary high school systems. I think there's also like different ways of conveying information that, that can like bring out story. Like, like I, I love reading, I love books and I love history, but I fucking hate reading. I hate books <laughs> and I hate old quotes. Straight up, like I, I, I love reading, I love history. Um, I hate old quotes. I hated having to read these fucking things like 17 times over and over again, not understanding it because it was written by some fucking clown ass in the 1400s. And I'm like, I don't get it, man. I don't get it, right? Like that, did, like my mind wants to learn this shit. So like part of my approach as a historian and as an independent publisher has been to kind of like frame my histories through storytelling. Where mm -hmm. it's like, you got to have your facts. Of course, of course, of course. But you know, your facts you couch within visuals right you gotta have lots of pictures you gotta have lots of maps and you gotta make it engaging but the key is stories stories are what 
build out the bare bones of these facts you know it's like you know buddy did thing and time and stuff and whatever cool whatever let's actually hear a story about someone living at that time in that world written in an accessible way that is easy for people to understand right as opposed to like written by some old white man for other old white people to teach young black people because that's literally what history books have been for 200 years is an old white man writes a book for old other other old white people to then teach non-white people the shit and it's like no no, no that's not how we do we yeah. gotta we gotta we gotta write our own history books you know what i mean it's indoctrination it's indoctrination, yeah. indoctrination for and and just like you Antoine, like i don't i mean like my household was very like yeah, you know, black people are awesome. We created a lot of things, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's amazing. We're, we're amazing uh, black people. Yay. Right. But in terms of really kind of understanding the depth of the history of blackness, it wasn't until I got to college. It mm -hmm. was like where I started having, where I started reading black authors, both uh, fiction and nonfiction, where I started exploring you know, courses that talked, you know, about, you know, um, not just pyramids, slavery, Martin Luther King Jr., everybody happy now, you know, not, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, those types of things, it was, it was, a, it was definitely a while before I even experienced that, and I would say college too, but that's one of the things that I think I love about Black Panther, because you can start off talking about Wakanda and say, guess what, there were, hundreds of Wakandas, on the, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of Wakandas on the African continent before colonization. There were dynasties and, you know, and, 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 and straight and, up empires, you know, like they, yeah, they existed Wakanda. already. Yeah, that were in many ways like Wakanda for their time periods. And let's do some work around that. Right. Timbuktu in particular, like that was like the sought after um, scholastic, you know, place that you went to, like, especially uh, for Arabia, you know, in particular, um, people would literally like come from all over just to go there. And like the thought that places like that didn't exist or could not exist is just like completely ridiculous mm -hmm. and need to be taught, you know. Right, and the right. same way we heard, we know Abraham Lincoln or uh, Alexander the Great, like Masa Musa, I didn't know about him until university. You know what I mean? Like we yeah. should be knowing about him as children. Mm hmm. Yeah. So you have you've already we've already had Wakanda in so many different ways, but utilizing this movie as an opportunity to bridge a link between fiction, between the fantastic and the reality of of society is one of the things that I really, really love about this movie is that you can take some real contemporary conversations that need to be had and put them before um, young people, old people, and really begin to have that conversation based on the fantastic. And know? mold it in a digestible way, as Rushi was yeah. saying, you know, like yeah. that's how you get to get people in there, right? Like, and that's the reason why I wrote my fantasy series too. It was a way to trick people into learning like African history. Like, oh, what is this? Like, what, where'd you get the idea of these, like, you know, these art, these fame archers? I was like, oh, that's just the Nubians. Like that, that they're called the Tasseti. Like, you know, like it's stuff like that, you know, like, or just like, where'd you get like this crazy monster thing from? It's like, oh, they're just, it's from Angola. Like, you know, it's like tricking people into like, here's a little snippet, they're really cool, right? Hey, actually let's learn some real history based off of this, right? Right, 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 right. And that um, it kind of in a, in a small little switch reminds me a little bit of Lovecraft Country in this sense mm -hmm. of um, when they, spoiler alert folks, when they did the, the summoning um, to get rid of the racist in the house. I mean, just that conversation for me with some of my Christian friends around like, hmm, you know, these religions that we kick, we kick to the side that, you know, kind of part of our history, you know, we should be thinking about them a little bit more. We should be exploring them a little bit more, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But it's things like that, that I think you can bring into conversations, you can bring into the classroom and say, listen, here's, here's this um, event that happened, you know, and let's talk about it from both the fantastic point of view of like, for instance, when we're thinking about Tulsa with Watchmen, you know, what would have happened if the Tulsa riot never happened? What would have happened? I mean, Lovecraft also has a tie to, that, to Tulsa too. But yeah, they all, they both did yeah, too, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so it, it's like one of those, one of those ways that you can bring in the fantastic to talk about reality. Mm -hmm. I think yep. another really a really neat way to kind of bring in um, these stories in an educational way are through fables. Um, 
Like there, there, there are there are there are dozens and dozens and dozens of folk fables from like across the African diaspora um, that are like like fables are for children. That's kind mm-hmm. of their shit, right? Um, so I I think that's a, a really really neat way to to, to kind of like peak people on on on, on like, like in, in in more like in more in more academic kind of way. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what's happening right now. I don't know if you guys um, have read uh, Kwame Mbalia's, um Tristan Strong Punches a Hole Through the Sky, um, but that is basically all like African-American folklore. Um, and, oh. and it's being told, and children are freaking cool. eating that up, just like they um, ate up cool. Percy Jackson. Um, and then Children of Blood and Bone with Tomiana Yemi and the Odisha stuff. It's, it's, it's all, yeah, again, I think like uh, to answer the, the, the overall our overarching question, yeah, I think media um, and, 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 and these stories are the best ways to like kind of you know get people like in the same way that we all know about the greek gods as much as we know the roman gods the, the norse and everything like that all that like putting that forward bullshit. yeah no it's, it's like in our cultural legacy we have all of these like white gods and, and queens mm-hmm. and princesses and it's like well what about ours where are ours where are ours in this story and mm-hmm. you know where they come in is like they're, they're, they, they're written by us for us um mm-hmm. so that we can see ourselves and then feel empowered to tell our own stories moving forward too Mm -hmm. And on that note, one of the other questions that arose, well, someone was looking for specific suggestions uh, for works of Afrofuturism in multiple genres. So Antoine, you already mentioned that excellent book. So I'd just like to hear from all three of you as we- Like recommendations? Yeah, as we round (laughs) off here, and and perhaps also a chance for you all to promote your own individual projects and publisher works. So maybe Antoine, uh, we can start with you. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, as I was saying before, uh, Kwambi and Balia uh, ju- not just came out. He actually came out with the second book, um, which is called Tristan Strong Destroys the World. So I'm like, what's gonna happen next? Are you gonna destroy the universe, the galaxy? What's, <laughs> how, how do you progress this trilogy? Um, it's like very great one is <laughs> yeah, exactly it, very similar. Um, so yes, if you have young children who who need that help of figuring out maybe some African history or some uh, African um, uh, African American specifically uh, folklore, like for instance, he runs around with John Henry and Rare Rabbit. It's freaking awesome. Uh, that's a great one. Uh, that's a great one to look at. at. Um, if you want to go a little bit older with Young Adult, there's Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi um, and Akata Witch by Nnedi Okorafor. Very good ones if you want to try that. Um, uh, adult N.K. Jemison, you can't go wrong with her. Uh, the Fifth Season is a, is a great one. She just did, a, did one recently called um, The City We Became, uh, which is r- fantastic as well. And then, of course, yes, then there's my books as well <laughs> in, in the indie <laughs> sphere. Uh, I'm also doing something that's very similar. I'm doing Young Adult uh, that's based around the Orishas called TJ Young and the Orishas. Uh, the Gatekeeper Staff is the book one. Um, I also do Tales from Esawan, which is more my pre-colonial, old-timey African stuff. Uh, in which I do um, a lot of African myth and, and that sort of a thing. But yeah, definitely check out. There's many authors out there that are doing really uh, great work. Uh, this last year in particular, I've been seeing, I saw a slew of, of, of new works that that should not be overlooked. Mm-hmm. And Antoine also has a great YouTube channel. So oh yeah, my YouTube do- channel. Yeah, yeah. The reason I don't miss my YouTube channel because I talk about things that are not African related. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, let's forget about them. But yes, for sure. <laughs> but it, it definitely should not be missed either. Uh, how about you, Stephanie? Yeah, especially if you love gaming, you don't want to miss out on it. <laughs> and, and versus videos, to be fair. That's what drew me. Um, Dater versus Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I always kind of take it old school a little bit um, in terms of uh, people who I recommend. Um, is uh, Octavia Butler, for sure. Gotta name her. Yeah, yeah. Samuel Delaney, um, if you are Black and queer, um, his stuff is is jarring and also like aha I get to see myself a little bit or maybe not you never know um yeah it I was reading uh this book a while back and this is kind of like for middle schoolers or high schoolers called New Orleans which was really amazing um I can't remember the name of the author but um it was kind of like after Katrina and it was a brilliant Afrofuturist book. Um, but yeah, there are so many books out there. Um, Antoine named so, a really great, some really great ones of uh, the um, Children of Blood and Bone. I have not got to it yet. It is on my list, um, but I will get to it. And of course, I wrote a book. They just started casting too for the movie because also got like um, uh, Lucasfilm is doing it, right? They just started casting for it. So it's coming. It's coming. Okay. That, that is amazing. I'm excited yeah. for that. Um, I also wrote a book called Bright City. Um, it's under my pen name, DC Edwards. If you get a chance, check it out. It's on uh, Amazon, I think. Still, yes. That's it. 
<laughs> awesome. And I'll just remind everyone the links for all our panelists' info are in the chat. So feel free to check those out. And Rashid, how about you? Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna zig where everyone zagged actually. Um, and I'm gonna recommend some music. Uh so let's oh yeah, let's good job. Yes, so yes. Brand, some, some Sun Ra. Um, maybe a bit of Herbie Hancock if you're feeling it, maybe a bit of Gil, Gil Scott Heron if you're feeling it. Um, but definitely, definitely uh hit up Spotify, check out Sun Ra. Hit one of his playlists, like maybe his radio one, it'll take you on a journey. Yes. Um, so with all those book lists you got there, listen to some Sun Ra while you're at it too. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, as for me, I guess, yeah, I'm a independent uh, publisher-ish. Um, like I started a little cooperative out of a music bar here in Toronto, um, the beginning of COVID. And uh, yeah, we um, make books and tell stories and we emphasize uh, kind of like the synthesis between words and pictures because um, words on their own are crazy like it, it, it's like this the, the the they've always said you know pictures worth a thousand words so it's like yeah. why hasn't well duh, let's do that then why write so much um so yeah that's that's me awesome thank, thank you so much and maybe if anyone had like closing remarks they'd like to share before we wrap up i'd love to hear them i realize we could talk about this forever and ever but uh, I don't know if you just want to like summarize your thoughts, your points, anything you didn't mention earlier, didn't get the chance to that you'd like um, to. To wrap it up, I think I would say like what I was saying before earlier, where I was saying how these things kind of happen in ebb and flows. You know what I'm saying? Like we were talking about like Tulsa, what would happen if that continued on? What would happen if the Black Panther Party continued on? What if like the 90s renaissance of media continued on? We're going through that right now. So I would say... Um, if you're out there, let, like, let's try and keep this going as a sustained thing rather than it just being like a blip on the map as it's been the past few times. Uh, and to do that, it's really you know just to put the support out there and not just to say that you're about it, but be about it as well. So. Amazing. It's so true, especially now. Um, how about you, Stephanie? Yeah, I think that uh, for me, as I, I am passionate about history and I've used Black Panther in a number of ways, um, to kind of begin conversations and and use it to kind of talk a little bit about, particularly in, in a U.S. context, what it means to be, um, what it means to be angry in terms of Killmonger, what it means to have conversations with um, our brothers and sisters um, across the diaspora about the nature of colonialism in our various forms, right? Because we all experience in a in a lot of different ways. Um, and so I love I, I love this movie for it for all of it being complicated for all of you know my complicated feelings about it. Um, but I would really encourage folks to really dig deep into how we can explore history in a way that um, really creates a full narrative rather than just taking the sound bites that we are given. Mm. Amazing. So true. Rashid, final word, my friend. Um, yeah, I'd like, uh, I'd like everyone to, to, to take away that you can, you can, you can do anything you want to as a creative person if you got a story to tell if you got a story to tell like like truly 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 it's your your greatest power is your voice and however you want to share it however you can share it don't let anyone tell you there's only one way to do things mm -hmm. like i remember like I was, when I was trying to talk to my dad about writing some stuff about his crazy life i could see he kind of like like he used to be a professor and like you know he was taught to write a certain way and i could see him kind of like stop himself and be like oh and i'm like no no baba listen listen like, I don't want you to write in that five paragraph bullshit way the English taught you. Like, Baba, I want you to tell me a story like you've been telling me stories as your son my whole life. I want it to be me and you walking down the beach in, in, in Kikambala in Kenya. And I want you to be telling me that story that way. So like, I got, that, that's kind of what I, what I hope we can all take away from this is that our voices are no longer being restricted. Our voices are loud and clear. We have platforms and we have the technology to communicate our ideas in a way we've never been able to before. Let's do it. Let's have some fun with it. Let's do it our way for us, help each other and support each other. You know, it's exciting. I couldn't have thought of a better note to end on. So that's awesome. Thank you, Rashid. Uh, before we wrap up here, I just wanted to promote uh, a few of the other events we have going on around Afrofuturism here at Lit and Lib. 
Uh, so if you want to hear more of Stephanie's excellent insight, there are two things you should look out for. One is another webinar uh, February 24th called Black and Indigenous Futurisms. Stephanie is one of the panelists there. Uh, so definitely consider registering and attending that. All the links will be in the chat. Uh, and Stephanie is also going to appear on our podcast in the episode coming out this Sunday, uh, where she'll delve into Afrofuturism and her particular writings uh, a little bit more. Uh, and then finally, on February 22nd, we have a panel event hosted by the Literary and Library Committee around Black Voices in Candlet. So that is definitely not to be missed. Uh, all the links for those upcoming endeavors are in the chat just so we can all stay uh, aware of them. Uh, and I wanna thank our three panelists, Antoine, Stephanie, and Rashid for giving their time. This was a fascinating discussion and I hope this will inspire people to continue these discussions in their own circles and writings. And I just wanna give a shout out to the Hart House team for helping put this together. Uh, and also to everyone who attended, uh, you know, we, we loved having you here. Uh, we hope you'll walk away from this event having learned a little something, adjusted your perspective, and hopefully trying to make the world a little bit of a better place through your creations. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, take care. And I, mean, I thought this was going to be a bit tacky. Like originally for my symbol for shifting the slides, it was like this. Uh, originally, I was thinking maybe this should be my symbol to switch the slides, but that might be a little bit too apropos. But maybe, maybe we could end it on, if, if you'll indulge me, uh, maybe we could end this on that note. So thank you, everybody. Um, Wakanda forever. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. All the best. Take care, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you.